Good morning, uh, or maybe another part of the day in your country. I'm not sure uh, when you are exactly watching uh, this video presentation. It's a big pleasure and uh, honor for me to make this uh, video presentation for you. First, I would like to introduce myself. Uh, I'm Vadim Ni. I'm from Almaty, the large city of Kazakhstan. Uh, I'm the chairperson of NGOs of Kazakhstan. Uh, uh, and my experience in environmental uh, protection began in 1994. The work in NGO sector is a pro bono activity for me, and I earn my living uh, as a freelance consultant on environmental law. In that capacity, I'm dealing with lawmaking, implementation of international environmental agreements, and also from time to time I involve uh, on into international negotiations on climate change and other international affairs uh, in the delegation of Kazakhstan. Uh, my presentation will be on the history, current stunning challenges of environmentalism in Kazakhstan and the role of environmental NGOs. And uh, it's pity that you were not able to come to Kazakhstan but um, uh, I, I'm also on a business street at, at the moment. Uh, I'm in Uzbekistan nearby the RLC and uh, very far from good internet connections. Uh, but uh, uh, my colleagues uh, uh, assisted me to produce a video presentation for you. And by using this video, we'll try to organize a, a virtual journey for you between different points and in time and space in Kazakhstan. We will begin our journey from Muinak, the starting point, where, uh, with the team of uh, uh, RLC. Then we will move to the uh, to Simei in Kazakhstan and our focus will be on the Sembilatinsk nuclear testing site. Thereafter, we will move to Pavlodar the industrial city of Kazakhstan, where the main challenge is industrial pollution. And then, uh, after that, we will uh, travel to the Caspian Sea region, the area of intensive uh, oil operation, operations taking place on onshore and offshore. And our last destination will be my home city, Almaty. Uh, where we will discuss the challenge of smoke emanating uh, from the combustion of fuel uh, to produce energy and heat, as well as from, from transportation. In each place, we will discuss the role of communities and environmental NGOs in addressing those environmental challenges. The first video which was shown to you is about the place where I stay at the moment. It's probably the, uh, the largest ever human-caused environmental disaster, the RLC. From the air you saw water in some places, but in essence the RLC disappeared. Until the 1960s it was the fourth largest lake in the world after the Caspian Sea, Lake Superior in the United States and Canada, and Lake Victoria shared by Kenya, Tanzania, and Uganda. It was the first in the world in terms of water surface. 
Now the lake shrunk for approximately 80-90% uh, from the initial 69,000 square, square kilometers. It is what can happen in near future in many places worldwide due to the climate change, but in this particular case it was not due to the climate change. At the moment there is no inflow uh, of water from the, to the lake from the two main rivers, Amudaria and Sirdaria. Only a small part of the former uh, water flow of Sirdaria is coming to the Aral Sea and no inflow from Amudaria. Waters from both rivers uh, were diverted for irrigation of cotton, um, rice, vegetables and fruits. So in the place where I stay at the moment, in Muinak, no RLC at all. People on the huge territory of Central Asia are suffering from the loss of jobs, worsening environmental and health conditions of life, and shortage of drink wa drinking water. Fortunately, a small part of the lake on the territory of Kazakhstan uh, was restored by the construction of a dam. The construction was supported by the World Bank, and in the 1990s, even in that part of the Aral Sea uh, region, people were not in the desperate situation. The water was very salted and no local fish species were able to survive in it and all the fishermen lost their jobs. To address that environmental challenge, Kazakhstan adopted in 1992 the law on social protection of uh, victims of the environmental disaster in the Aral Sea region and the residents of Kazakhstan in that region were recognized victims and they were entitled to a number of social benefits. The law is still in force but the social benefits are not and uh, step by step the government uh, reduced them to nothing. Arzot's benefits are not needed anymore. I doubt it because we don't have the clear picture from the government on what's going on in the RLC region. In particular as it concerns human health and environmental conditions of life. Now I will discuss the briefly the role of NGOs played in that story. I can provide you a good example of an NGO, Aral Tennessee, or the, in English the RLC. It was a civil, uh, officially established in 1998 to consolidate the efforts by fishermen. And the NGO took the lead to introduce flounders into the remaining part of the lake because the only fish species that were able to uh, survive in the over salted water at that time were flounders. Now after the construction of the dam, around 30 fish species do exist in the so-called small Aral Sea and the fishery is growing there. The dam can keep all the coming water and from time to time a part of water from the Aral Sea, small Aral Sea, is being released to, the, to protect the installation. The Aral Tennessee continues its activities and they are trying to conserve the fish species in the waters released outside the small Aral Sea and they develop aquaculture. I presume that it's extremely important to have such NGOs in place to consolidate people and find solutions at the community level to address such environmental challenges uh, they are facing with. The story you just watched is on the Semipalatinsk nuclear testing site. It was the main polygon for testing nuclear weapon by the Soviet Union. 
and it is on the territory of Kazakhstan. The first explosion took place in August of 1949 and then it happened there for 40 years and nuclear explosions took 473 times. The cumulative effect of nuclear explosion was higher in 2,500 times than the explosion of nuclear bombs in Hiroshima and Nagasaki in Japan. It's caused damage to the health of more than 1 million people in Kazakhstan. Over 300,000 square kilometers were affected by nuclear explosions. For the comp comparison, this territory is approximately equal to the whole territory of Italy. The official decision on closure of the Simplatin testing uh, site was taken on 29th August of 1991. I think that the main pressing factor for taking that decision were protests by citizens' movement Nevada Semei. It was probably the most famous public protest in the history of Kazakhstan. Most participants of Nevada Semei retired from uh, active social activities or some of them even uh, passed away. But I believe that the history of that movement was at the heart of history of getting the national sovereignty by Kazakhstan. In 1992, Kazakhstan adopted the law on social protected, uh, protection of victims due to the nuclear explosions uh, on the Sempelatsk Sempel nuclear uh, testing site. By that law, uh, the government provided the status of affected people and, and uh, enabled them to so some social benefits. Uh, similarly to the law on uh, the RLC, it's still in force, but in essence social benefits to victims are not. In this case, there is no at all reasons to pretend as if the environmental situation has been improved there and no, that no any more effects on, of radiation on, to human health. Nevertheless, it happened. Moreover, a number of initiatives were undertaken in Kazakhstan since that time, which are, were contrary to the radiation safety, safety of the country. One of them was at the beginning of the 19, 2000s, when the Kazatomprom, the national company, uh, proposed the idea that Kazakhstan could import foreign nuclear uh, waste and use the income to bury uh, imported and owned waste, radioactive waste, in Kazakhstan. Initially, that plan was supported by uh, many high officials in uh, Kazakhstan. However, after the idea was opposed by environmental NGOs and the public, uh, I was one of the coordinators of that anti-nuclear campaign. The idea was dropped by the government and it was success by the public and the environmental NGOs and my good friend and colleague Kaisha Tahanova was awarded in 2005 the Goldman Prize, the most prestigious environmental prize for environmentalists in the world. From that period of time, I never heard uh, that plan was good and that the um, environmentalists, were, it was stupid action by them to prevent the, the import of radioactive waste and to prevent the use of uh, income uh, for the radioactive cleanup of the country. Uh, moreover, from that time, Kazakhstan has generated much more income from the oil sector, but we don't see any significant investments from the government into safe nuclear and all other hazardous waste disposal. Nevertheless, all the time when we are opposing some plans, projects by companies or the government, um, the, which are crazy from environmental perspective, we hear that it's contrary to the national interest. In many cases, we are at risk for such actions. So, my discussion point, who should care about the environmental aspects of life, protection of nature and environmental uh, effects to human health? Who should voice uh, those concerns? Uh, and that is the NGO role. In our country, 
there is no even a national environmental authority and the environmental ministry was liquidated in 19, the 2014. That is another aspect to think about the role of environmental NGOs and activists. On the photos you have just seen is our next destination in Kazakhstan, the city of Pavlodar. It's not far from the semiplatinic nuclear testing site, but in that place the industrial pollution is the most important environmental challenge for its residents. The two photos were taken at different time at public meetings against two different projects, one in 1980s and the second one in 2015. In both cases, the public, environmental the public was successful to oppose the project and they were not implemented. On the other photo, you can see the portrait of Vladimir Lenin on the wall. So it took place when the Soviet Union still existed. It was in the second half of the 1980s. The residents opposed at that time the project on the construction of, a, of an albuminous manufactory. The, that, that public campaign had led to the establishment in Pavlodar, one of the first environmental NGOs in Kazakhstan, ECOM. This non-governmental organization is still operational. The more recent photo was taken in 2015 and it's about the public hearings on the project uh, to construct the, an incinerator of hazardous waste in uh, Pavlodar. Mostly it was about the persistent organic pollutants. It was uh, on the environmental impact assessment of the project. Some people were wearing in a gas mask because of the concerns over the already high level of industrial pollution in the city, uh, emanating from numerous energy and metal installations. Thus, the public concerns were not only on pollution from the proposed installation, but also on the cumulative effect to human health. For environmentalists and the public in Kazakhstan, it is important that Kazakhstan is a party to the Aarhus Convention. It's the Pan-European Convention on Public Environmental Rights. The rights to know, to participate in environmental decision-making, and to challenge the decision affecting environmental rights of the public. We can participate in public hearings on environmental uh, impact assessment of some project with significant environmental effects. It enables public to oppose some environmental dangerous projects or at least to express relevant public concerns to competent authorities and project developers. The NGO ECOM in Pavlodar, as well as environmental NGOs in other regions, uh, do play the important role to raise public environmental awareness on such proposed activities. Also, they consolidate members of the public or uh, in such decision-making processes and facilitate effect effective public participation, especially at, uh, during the public hearings. It's quite usual in our country that at public hearings, project developers and public authorities are at one side and environmental NGOs and the public at the other side and opposing them. Then we can hear complaints from uh, uh, public authorities and project developers that's about our pub negative public opinions and that we are opposing the proposed activities and that the protests are provoked by environmental NGOs Often they expect, probably even, uh, that we will come to public hearings where the sole intention to support a uh, proposed project and with some minor and very gentle suggestion from our side. And then my discussion point on this part of the presentation. Is it possible for environmentalists to protect the nature and promote sustainable practices by being always very amicable 
and so uh, yeah, polite with uh, project developers. Is it reasonable to spend resources for environmental impact studies and holding public events to hear only complimentary words to the project developers and public authorities? next destination is the Caspian Sea region. Two or three decades ago it was famous uh, worldwide of the sturgeon fishery and black caviar. The main spawning sites for the sturgeon fish uh, were in Kazakhstan and they were protected by the national law from the Soviet time. However, by step by step the government weakened it, that legal regime to, to enable uh, development of oil deposits in that area. Now we, and including the residents of that region, we can see that sturgeon fish are only as aquaculture and mainly in supermarket aquariums. Until recently we can also enjoy of watching of other cute guys uh, from the Caspian Sea, Caspian Seal, Caspian Seals. It was similar to watching of sea lions on Pier 39 in San Francisco but the fate of uh, Caspian uh, seals is very different from those uh, sea lions in San Francisco. Many thousands of them died in 2000. Hundreds of uh, died Caspian seals were found on the seashore in 2017. And from time to time we see on the seashore they died uh, uh, Caspian seals. Last year, some experts declared that it's likely that we are losing uh, the, the population of those species. And the authorities are denying that it happened due to oil operations and pollution uh, of the sea. Like in my previous stories, uh, these sad, sad stories with sturgeon fishery in the Caspian Seals can be, attribute, can be attributed to the Soviet legacy because they happened after the getting the sover 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 national sovereignty by Kazakhstan. Someone can say that poachers uh, were guilty for the loss of sturgeon fishery in the Caspian Sea by Kazakhstan, but it is the fact that uh, the loss of biodiversity of the Caspian Sea occurred at the same time when we, uh, we began the development of uh, offshore oil uh, operations in that sea. The Caspian Sea is on a halfway from my home city to Western Europe and sometimes it's uh, difficult to get the information from that region. Uh, so we have, currently we don't have proper access to information on what exactly is happening to that uh, species and the ecosystem of Caspian Sea. Uh, and we are dependent of the uh, local NGOs and the most strong environmental NGO in the Caspian Sea uh, region was Caspi Tabigati, uh, uh, the uh, name in uh, English, the Caspian Nature. The NGO was established in 1998, uh, eight, but it ceased officially uh, its activities uh, three years ago, and they declared that the legal environment for uh, NGOs in the country becoming too hostile, 
uh, to survive and to continue their activity. It was about a series of uh, targeted amendments to legislation on non-profit organizations and tax regulations. They had led to extremely burdensome reporting requirements for NGOs, which are much more burdensome than for uh, businesses. So the NGO decided that they are too exposed to the ever-present threat of tax inspections and penalties. My discussion point for this story is about the role of environmental NGOs in raising public environmental awareness and uh, ensuring the access to environmental information. Uh, we can have in place different environmental institutions or authorities. Uh, we still can have, even without NGOs, individual environmental activists, but the NGOs are making their opinions vocal. Other players can find sometimes uh, some justification of keeping silence on uh, very sensitive issues and then you don't know what is going on in the ecosystem and in your environment despite numerous studies and assessments. Because in many cases they are dependent of relevant business development. Now we are approaching the, my home, to my home city, Almaty. On the video from the plane, you saw the usual smoke, dense smoke over the city. Almaty is surrounded by mountains and its residents can enjoy mountains ecosystems. The negative aspect of it that we breathe what we emit to the air. And the air emissions include, include emissions from the energy, from heating, from uh, transportation, and it is the main environmental ch challenge for the uh, Almaty residents. And then the question is how and where we can get the information about air quality in Almaty. Traditionally, the institution which is uh, monitoring the air quality in Almaty is Cas Hydromet. It's financed and subordinated to the national government. Some of Cas Hydromet's monitoring stations are providing data on air quality in real-time mode. Uh, but not surprisingly, uh, all, the, all of those stations are located in more cleaner places and closer to the mountains to show good picture of uh, air quality in Almaty. Thus, the public in Almaty do not, does not trust anymore in monitoring data provided by gas hydromet. Several year, years ago, a group of young persons from NGOs and thereafter an individual, uh, a resident of Alma T, established their own monitoring systems. They are measuring just one air pollutant, PM2.5, and publish the, the data online. Now the residents of Almaty are following and trust the monitor, monitoring data from them. And in Almaty we are proud of such citizens' initiatives and we are supporting such uh, activists. We are trying to deal uh, with, because we are trying to deal with uh, uh, public services at the community level. In, and that's what makes unique Almaty in Kazakhstan. Of course, the municipality is also taking some measures to incentivize people to use public transport, promote cycling, walking, disincentivize the use of personal cars, and by doing this, to reduce emissions uh, into the air. Nevertheless, it's not enough, and we do not have the significant improvement of air quality because there is no progress with stationary sources of air emissions. Recently, a resident of Almaty sued the municipality for not taking um, proper measures on the cold fire energy municipal installation, the use of coal for heating in individual houses, and he lost the case in the court, but residents have appreciated him for taking this um, courageous action. 
My discussion point is that in this case, that uh, environmental aspects of life are becoming more important for the public. And if the government and municipalities are not taking the lead in these areas, citizens are doing it themselves. I, I see it at, as a new opportunity and for growing the role of environmental NGOs in the society and also it's raising up, the, but also it's raising the, up the following questions. Then uh, why we are paying to the government for the public services which are ineffective and even meaningless uh, to the citizens? Это может стать прекрасным примером. Заявил исключительное нарушение закона и более того. Например, в Якубе даже просто возместить эту сумму без всяких расходов потребуется около минимум 49 лет. По самым минимум. Они такие же граждане наши. 226 голосов за Жузубекова Нурлана. The final introductory video report is on the topic of conservation of natural sites and uh, their importance for people in modern urban societies. You saw some beautiful scenes of uh, surroundings of Almaty, namely the Ili Altao National Park. Also you saw that uh, many people in at, uh, at public event, it was the recent public hearings in Almaty, and it was opposing the development of ski resort on the territory which was recently a part of the, that uh, national park. It was the ski resort proposed by the, and promoted by the uh, local municipality and the public hearings take place on 4th of November last year and the final decision is not taken yet. And this part uh, of discussion, I will begin with the uh, presentation of information on the activities of the NGO Green Salvation, one of the uh, most famous uh, NGOs, environmental NGOs in Kazakhstan. The organization was established in 1990 and they uh, work for many years to protect the national park uh, and it's uh, their main, one of the main focus of their activities. They are taking many actions during the many years in this regard, uh, including environmental litigations against various public authorities to compel them to uh, do relevant conservation actions and sometimes even to clean up the garbage left them by different um, uh, developers in uh, the territory of uh, uh, National Park. Green Salvation and other environmental NGOs and environmental activists in Almaty are trying to protect the Ileelatao National Park and natural sites from the urbanizations and the very traditional approach of public authorities to tourism development on natural territories. The most recent example is uh, the, the example mentioned by me that's uh, the idea to construct a ski resort on Kogjaleau. It was and still is the most popular site for ecotourism, for uh, weekends to residents to rest in the mountains for walking in the mountains, it's, uh, they spent the whole day on Kogjalau, but in 2014 the municipality took that uh, site from the Ilielotau National Park, now it's not a, a part of the National Park, and they want to uh, construct there a, a, a ski resort. The Kogjalau ski resort is the most criticized project in Kazakhstan, uh, in the last decade uh, and it's being considered as not sustainable and not economically viable at all. It is opposed not just by environmentalists, by the general public, which includes famous journalists, economists, lawyers and many people from, um, uh, from Almaty. 
and they joined their, their efforts at the, as the Save Kogzalao campaign. And similar campaign, public campaigns are taking place in Canada on the Jumbo Ski Resort and the, in Bulgaria on the Pirin Ski Resort. But what is different in Canada and Bulgaria, representative, representative of the public won their cases in the court and we are not able to do so in Kazakhstan. And in uh, Canada and uh, Bulgaria, the governments are gradually are giving up on their, their uh, proposed projects. And of course, one of the reasons not to develop such projects is the global warming and that glaciers are melting and the snowpacks are decreasing and the ski resort development is considered at not, uh, as not a, a very prospective project uh, in many parts of the world. Also, in the case of the ski resort, um, what, uh, of, uh, uh, by Almaty municipality, it is important to mention that the government, the municipality, is proposing to com connect the uh, remote area to the existing energy, traditional energy and drinking water supply and sewerage systems, uh, which makes the, this project extremely um, um, expensive and then therefore uh, economically non-viable. And that is the part of the, the why it's criticized by the public. I will conclude my presentation by this example of uh, ski resort development because it's a mass uh, protest against the municipality and providing many uh, new uh, aspects of how to develop environmentalism and also for future of environmentalism, the uh, working together the environmental NGOs and uh, the communities and we see that uh, the environmental aspects are becoming not important only for, for environmentalists and the public hearings and the, um, the protests are not between environmentalists and non-environmentalists. Uh, it's uh, like in this case, it's about the ability of the government and municipalities to provide public services in sustainable manner. It's about the uh, ability of public uh, uh, authorities to provide services expected uh, from them uh, by communities. In modern world, we are less and less interested in future develop further development of giant national infrastructure for everything, uh, which was uh, especially um, yes, uh, very uh, widespread in the Soviet Union. People understand better than bureaucrats that we can use either the accessible global infrastructures or local solutions, which is more uh, sustainable in many cases. It concerns many sectors, including energy, we can use the small wind and energy installations, it's uh, by uh, uh, toilets or um, ecotourism ex ex instead of the development and construction of huge um, hotels and uh, uh, even in, that, in the case of environmental monitoring, we saw that instead of the huge uh, monitoring uh, network of Hydromed, the local experts, uh, local activists are, were, were developed their own, own uh, networks to monitor the uh, air quality. So it's, uh, it's, that's showing that the role of governments and municipalities is changing. And the question is following, if they will be able to respond to new challenges or not. If they will not, I think that communities will try to find some other solutions to uh, and suppliers for those public services. Because uh, the, we see that at the moment the, the municipalities are not uh, responsive to those uh, demands by the public. I think that uh, it's very important um, from um, uh, following the history of environmental NGOs in Kazakhstan that uh, the challenges, environmental challenges are happening or appearing in many regions and they're changing. We had some in, uh, during the Soviet time, we have some new environmental challenges and it's important that uh, there will, should be some 
people who will come up to respond to those challenges and it's important that uh, to enable and not to prevent the establishment of environmental NGOs because it's provide the opportunity for environmental activists, for individuals uh, to consolidate their efforts and to take uh, and, um, and actions more efficiently. And that is the role is played uh, by environmental NGOs in the society because they can um, pro ensure the many um, services uh, to the society, access to information, um, um, assistance with public participation, raising uh, environmental uh, concerns in the society, uh, protection of environmental rights, and even the, uh, taking some actions uh, instead of the government, like in, in Almaty, where um, uh, activists are dealing with many public services, which were initially the governmental services. It's uh, air uh, quality monitoring, it's uh, the waste separation, and I think it's good that uh, we are proud of what's uh, going on at the moment in Kazakhstan and, and in Almaty in particularly. Thank you very much.